So, uh, are you as obsessive as they say? Obsessed? Oh, people love to characterize your work as obsessive. I guess so. You know what? I I some I don't think I'm obsessed anymore, and I kind of miss that. Uh, I've had to work hard to to at least uh, manufacture. Uh, a simulacra of, or facsimiles of obsession. I used to be really obsessive when I started out uh, and obsessed with like bad sound. And, and, like the, I became kind of a connoisseur of different kinds of distortion and static and, and things like that. And I, don't even ask me why. I, I used to try to speculate why I was obsessed with that stuff, but it just made me feel good. I was maybe addicted, you know, more than obsessed. And then somewhere in the mid-90s, I lost all my obsessions for a while, and I was able to get some back, I, I, and I, I, learned, I fell in love all over again with primitivity, and I'd, I guess I'd been made to feel inferior because I'd been working in just 16 millimeter film, which in the 90s always means you're on your way up to 35 or 70 millimeter or something like that, and so all these producers I would meet would all say the same thing to me, you've got to, you know, you've got to start working in you know, in color, you got to start using real actors. You got to, you know, which is super insulting to the actors I've used. And then you've uh, got to start doing this and that. And uh, so I, I became kind of unmoored for the longest time, and and fell out of love with what I was doing. And then um, I discovered through the magic of Super 8 cameras that if I just pointed myself technologically in the other direction, there was so much beauty to be behold. And I started getting obsessed again with, with. Merc and scratches of a different kind, visual, visual um, um, distortion and visual things. I don't know. I just started feeling at home again, and I, I haven't even bothered thinking about doing anything mainstream since. And I feel a lot better. I'm kind of obsessed with feeling good, and uh, the only way I can feel good is if I'm doing what I want to do. Where did the uh, the desire or the appreciation of the black and white come from? You think? You know, I, I'm not sure. I, my best theory, it's maybe just too tidy, was that um, I was the youngest of four children, but my three other siblings were a lot older than I was, and my parents were quite old when they had me, and they were just so spent out, they kind of just dropped me on the floor in front of the brand new television, which they brought home the same day that they brought me home from the hospital. And, um, and then I just spent a lot of time watching black and white TV and looking through old this old photo album that had my younger parents and my older siblings when they were young and my hand-me-down toys before they were destroyed and and a different dog, a smarter, more cleverer dog, I was told all the time than the stupid old lazy perpetually sleeping chihuahua I had and uh, everything just seemed better in these two-dimensional representations of my family in these black and white photos than than the family I had uh, looking after me or not looking after me. They did a wonderful job, and I love my family, but they just seemed to be always busy and tired and things like that, as opposed to this almost so so lively and youthful and good-looking, they seemed like almost like showbiz personalities in this old photo album that, I, I don't know, I just think I made some kind of mystical leap between the real humdrum people I loved and the sort of glitzy representation of, of them. And I made that leap, the, uh, the nature of which I, no one really truly understands when they're watching a movie. You know, you, you sort of shift gears. You don't really believe those people on the screen are real or anything like that, even when you see them on the sidewalk. And somehow, so I think I had my own star system at home somehow. And, and so it helped me when I finally started watching movies in my 20s, um, I felt at home somehow. But maybe that's just a bit too pat, uh, that explanation. I don't know. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, maybe this is wrongful deduction, but what I'm hearing you say is that when you see the two dimensions, like you kind of infer your own third, and that's kind of magical. Yeah, well, I, I was always, those, the photo albums just kind of read like, they might as well have had text in them. They read like storybooks. and. Um, and just, even though it was just a few years before my birth, that prehistory seemed immense, way bigger than any three years I've lived in since I was born. And it just, 
or five years or ten years or whatever it might this this little immediate prehistory uh, just leading up to my birth just seems so mythic and huge and for most people it's their early it's their first five or six years that are mythic and huge but for me it was the few years leading up to my birth somehow I don't know I, I just think differently I guess or it's I don't think differently I just love differently I, I want to ask you kind of a strange question um, it's debated that your observations of life are more pointed towards the oddities or eccentricities than sort of the more mundane happenstances. And uh, because of that, people have extrapolated uh, or conjectured whatever. They try to figure out if you're coming from the stance of having had an eccentric <laughs> upbringing or not having had an eccentric, or having had an eccentric upbringing versus not having had one and therefore having a creative imagination. To that, I want to ask, is it true that you got a cold from a cousin that resulted in a neurological infection and the permanent persistent sensation that ghosts are touching you all over your body? Um, yes, except it was my nephew. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. the only difference, the only thing you got wrong. Yeah, it, it happened back in, actually, just before no, about uh, 10 months after I made my first appearance at a film festival, which was here, San Francisco Film Festival, happened in 1990. And uh, yeah, so I was an adult and got sneezed on until I got a cold. And you know, you get colds in your sinuses sometimes or in your throat. Um, I got one in the, that just somehow got into the base of my skull and, and it got into my nervous system a little bit and I got these, they're very common apparently, just little myoclonic seizures. But it, so, uh, but it does feel like uh, about six to eight times a minute, if I'm not on meds, it feels like I'm being molested at random places on my body. You know, just touched with a couple of friendly fingers, it sort of could move me around a room. It really tormented me because the doctor, my first doctor couldn't figure out what it was and um, uh, I was really scared secretly scared it was something with initials and really you know frightening or, but um, uh, it just turned out to be pretty treatable with giant horse tranquilizer sized tablets of uh, clonazepam and things like that stuff that club kids would take with a beer and get really high you know I take six of them first thing in the morning and mm -hmm. I refer to those days as the bad wedding years they were sort of I, I slept really deeply that's all they were just metaphoric Bedwetting. <laughs> no literal rubber pants, but figurative. <laughs> oh, once or twice, maybe. <laughs> it's really embarrassing. I'm trying to forget it. Well, it's interesting because ghosts figure in your films. I mean, they're, they're yeah. dramatic, and they're totally real. They're not. They're not medication. Um, yeah, I don't believe really believe in ghosts either, uh, or stuff like that. But I really like them as. Uh, I guess I don't know as when I'm watching a movie or reading or listening to a ghost story I believe in them and then because they're really great storytelling devices somehow you know what's better you could ask any serious reader than Hamlet's ghost you know it's it's so great and and we're all haunted by ghosts and and all that stuff we all have scars and things I don't know it's just such a convenient I, and I'm just more of a maniac for melodrama and always room for another ghost in a melodrama.